the overlap between the two, how artificial intelligence can support business intelligence. And as our AI expert here, we have Silvio Tudor Zedban. Hello. Uh, nice to be here. Nice to uh, be in Belgrade for the first time. I hope you've enjoyed the conference so far. So uh, looking forward to this discussion. You're very welcome. Yeah, and uh, as our business intelligence expert, we have Christina Klassen. Okay, and I wish I wouldn't have mentioned the mojitos because everybody ran to the river to drink mojitos. I've got it. Okay, it's my fault. When somebody's asking, it's my fault. It's okay. So, uh, can I start by just inviting yourself, you, to the two of you, to introduce yourself briefly? What do you do? What is your background in regards to AI and BI? Uh, so, I've started uh, doing artificial intelligence about eight years ago. I started as an intern researcher. Then I moved to the business side, and now I'm also dipping into entrepreneurship and uh, consultancy. Thank you. Should I introduce myself again? Okay, so I'm Christina Klassen, <laughs> and um, I came now for the fourth time, before I introduce myself, I have just to say something else. I am now for the fourth time in Belgrade, and I have to say one thing. When I would have been asked for USP for this country, I would say definitely they are people. I just love the people who are here. You're very open-minded, you're warm-hearted, and I just love to be here. And I love the food. Okay, this, but this is another thing. I just love the food you serve here. So I'm really glad to be here. Thank you. And to my background, I was before on stage for the ones of you who missed it. I do um, business in IT since 21 years, 22, 23, don't, don't, don't ask. It's long time, very long time. And um, I started in IT like in technical um, areas. So there's, I would say there's no job in IT I haven't done. So I did it all. Network administration, Linux administration, programming, database administration, you name it, I did it. And now I do business advisory and with a focus of business intelligence. Impressive. So I would like to start moving in concentric circles and I'd like to invite you to start to define the respective fields. What on earth is AI? Well, wow, that's, a, that's a tough one. So I consider AI the evolution of software. So imagine that the data we collect every day can be used to, to define how software will work in the future. We're already doing that. It's called machine learning. Uh, so AI, let's say, is a superset of machine learning, which uh, also includes some other fields which are, are really, really helping, let's say, uh, the world go forward by getting integrated into several businesses and uh, several use cases uh, that we might encounter every day right now. Uh, from my point of view, uh, AI is a blanket term like the cloud. It means a lot of things. Uh, for some people, it means, uh, I don't know, the Terminator. For me, it means the future and uh, a better uh, hope to live uh, a, a longer life, a healthier life, and uh, have better conditions for everything. Brilliant. Christina? Well, business intelligence is um, very wide, from my understanding. I can just share how I see this. Business intelligence is, for me, um, a collection of data and tools which help me in the company to make better decisions, to support the decision maker. So I would say for me the big difference is between your area and mine. You let the machines make the decisions and business intelligence support people to make the decisions. I will allow a brief reply to that. <laughs> uh, I, I agree, I agree. The pe people are needed well, behind AI. <laughs> so. Okay, brilliant. So, no. To circle in a little bit, could you tell us a little bit about what kind of AI are you working with? So I'm specialized in a field called computer vision. So imagine, uh, I don't know, automatic detection of people or uh, like if you have the latest iPhone, the logging in using your face. Uh, more than that, imagine going to, to a hospital and, and using a machine learning uh, enabled system to detect some kind of disease faster than, than the human could. So uh, this, is, this is the field I work in, uh, specifically in security, understanding people, uh, understanding emotions, and how 
these systems can uh, can be implemented into products right now. So you're telling me you can have like a camera that just sees me and says Thomas is happy and he's got a little bit of a flu going on. Yeah, and to, to go a little further from there, uh, imagine what this kind of information gathered over time can reveal about, uh, about you, about uh, patterns that you have, I, I don't know, psychological patterns or uh, patterns that may be, uh, let's say, detrimental in, in a way for you, and you can uh, observe them using this, this type of AI and uh, help you not go through them again. Thomas should do more sit-ups. <laughs> okay. Uh, Christina, uh, the same question to you. What is it you do within business intelligence? Um, well, starting with the development of the applications and um, having the privilege to be able to base my decisions and my consultancy on this knowledge, what I do now is more about the strategy for the companies. So like to give you um, one, two examples, when a company just this particular example, a big company with 50,000 um, employees. They're about to exchange their core system, the operating system. And of course, when you are changing the core system, you impact um, the business intelligence part as well, because you change the data, you change the data format, you change everything. So it's the next step for every company is like to evaluate the tools, the new tools on the market, because like it's very short term now. The life cycle of the tools, it's so short, you have to stay um, up all the time and to watch it. So and then when the company is about like to invest maybe six millions or maybe 40 millions, and they ask, okay, what would be the right tool set for me? Because it's not just one tool you're buying for six millions, you have different um, departments in the company, you have different requirements, so you have to get the right tool set in your company, right? And this is what I do then. I um, help the, my clients to specify the requirements, to understand their needs, because everybody of you who is working in consultancy or in project management, and um, who is collaborating with all the departments in the on the client side, I am sure you will agree that for the clients, they mostly don't know what they want. And this is the biggest challenge, to make them understand what are their real needs. And this is what, where I come in. I help them to understand their needs. And then I help them to find the right tool which fits these needs. And how do you help them understand their needs? How do I help them? Yes. I it ask questions. It's very simple. You know, one thing I learned in life, when we um, are struggling, when we are looking for an answer, um, we tend to look for something very complicated. I made the experience, the best things in life are very simple. It is in my personal experience, right? Um, and when I'm looking for an answer, I have to find the right question. And this is what I do. I sit together with my clients and I just ask questions. And I say always, there's nothing like a stupid question, it doesn't exist, yeah. Uh, have you got some sort of special process so you know ahead of time what kind of questions when to ask? Of course, of course. Of I'm course not just sitting here, don't. let's drink a <laughs> coffee and I'll talk what do you want. No, definitely no, no, of course. It's, it's a process, it's a system. So you go through different levels, of course. You go through different departments and then you evaluate because um, when you have, when you talk about data, they're so um, heterogeneous. You have different systems, you have different data formats, you have different needs here. Yeah. You have to systemize it to success, to have success, definitely. Perfect. Uh, is there some, something you could give us as a takeaway as part of this system, some clever question, some clever question to ask? Well, what I can offer is... Um, or a guideline as to when to ask it. Yeah, no, what I, what I can offer is you can send me an email. Um, so my contact details were before and there. I can share with you some of the questions which I think they are key um, decision maker for me to help my clients. I would be glad to do so, yeah, definitely. Um, but it always depends on the tool set you're looking at. Right? It's always yeah. context dependent. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. So now the next question is this. What is the biggest thing that people outside of your sector don't know? What is the biggest thing that people don't understand, that people don't get about AI? Should, should I take look it? at me. <laughs> well, I, I think people see AI as it was portrayed in the movies. I mean, most people, not everyone, but most people do see it as uh, 
science fiction shows it. But I, I think nowadays we're, we're closer in, in a sense, AI is more like a tool. So it, it allows us to, to do some things better. Some things are dangerous, of course, but w it allows us to do many things much better than, than before. Uh, for example, I, I think a couple of months ago or a month ago, uh, there was a, a launch uh, of a rocket by uh, SpaceX. So what they did, they used AI to uh, help the rocket's boosters uh, land in the same place w from where they, uh, they went up. And I think this is one of the, the examples that th some things cannot be done by us manually. So we, we can use AI as a tool to enhance our abilities. So there's gonna be people uh, you know, moderating or watching uh, what these this systems are doing and writing some algorithms to contain, let's say, the, or, or do damage control in, in some cases. Uh, but the AI should be seen in a more positive way as uh, I believe in the future, everything will be, uh, everything about AI will be towards, or mostly towards our benefit. So uh, using AI to help guide the Tesla rocket back to the uh, lift off pla plane. Uh, it's basically a system that uh, gets attached to your dashboard in, while you're driving, and it uh, monitors the driver throughout the entire trip, and realizes before you fall asleep or you become drowsy that you are in a dangerous uh, situation and will let you know that you should uh, take an action to, to avoid the, uh, this type of issue. And there are already some systems that do this. Some, some cars do have this detection. They have uh, some sensors on their wheels uh, or, uh, sorry, on their steering wheel. Uh, and also some cameras, but uh, the thing is, with, with AI, you can do much more. You can uh, not just detect when, when something bad happens, you can, you can understand it before it happens. So you, you, there's a predictive factor there that only AI can unlock. So, so it's, it's a camera, and it sees that, too. and then it wakes you up. Well, it, it, uh, that's, that's the point. It, it, it knows that you're going to fall asleep before you need to be woken up. So that's the key because uh, if you just fall asleep for like a couple of seconds, that could that could be enough. Yes. Could be enough for you to crash. May May I ask? Of something? course. What I like pretty much what you just mentioned is about like people get scared of it, and I agree with it. So I see this um, when you get you know, the more information you get in pr process, the more automation you get, um, the people get scared for se for different reasons. Yeah, like um, is um, the machine taking my job? And I would say the answer is yes, but it doesn't matter. Find another job, redefine yourself, right? And to be scared of the data they are collected. So I like that you are point, pointed it out because it's, it's what happens in our minds here. Yeah? So it's, mach machines are taking over. Oh. Well, I think it's becoming a less of an issue in Europe anyway. Uh, we're going to have GDPR coming in soon. So everyone who's making software, artificial intelligence, and whatnot is going to have to be more you know, uh, careful how they handle data and maybe you will be more geared to uh, do everything or do some parts of the algorithms at the edge. So then, then the, let's say your data is safe, you, you, you get a uh, next level of, uh, I don't know, driving safety in, in this particular case, or in many cases, it, many of the data does not have to go uh, directly to some, I don't know, cloud database where uh, it can be, I don't know, hacked. Uh, it can become just metadata going there, and uh, even if it gets hacked, you you, you don't lose, lose anything. And, uh, may I ask a question? I, I'm curious about artificial intelligence. Um, there are many areas when it's coming in. It's um, healthcare, it's um, education, you name it. Um, do you see any tendency which which um, areas are more um, likely to to be taken over by artificial intelligence? I I think the the most important one, from my point of view, is, is going to be healthcare. So, uh, you know, there's there's a degree of accuracy when when doctors do some kind of uh, when when they analyze you and say, okay, you have this problem or you don't have this problem. Uh, they do get it wrong sometimes. So, of course, there's going to be the you know top level doctors that will mostly never fail. But there's also the ones that are beginning and are not so experienced, so they might miss stuff. And if they would use uh, a system that would also assist them to, 
maybe you know uh, take their hand and uh, show them, hey, maybe there's something here. You should check it out more. Uh, in in these cases, I, I I see the most benefits for for humankind. Yeah, and what so, I see. So uh, I would actually like to turn that question on its head. A, a few years back, I did a, one of those silly Facebook tests and asked the question, "What's the likelihood I will be replaced by a robot?" It was twelve percent. Uh, so my question is the opposite of the previous one. Are there any jobs that are safe? Well. I I think there's some jobs that aren't safe, especially the jobs that are menial. But you shouldn't think about a job that is safe anymore in, in, in this world. You should think about how you can uh, make yourself be valuable in the future. I like it. A good attitude. Um, so, uh, Christina, your background uh, as a businesswoman and your expertise in business intelligence can you get a sense that AI support would be useful, is useful in any of the cases mentioned? Say again the question? Uh, basically, can you, is there anything you can see or say about uh, AI being useful as a support, as an input into business intelligence? Yeah, At well, yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice question um, because we had this discussion before, right? So for me, it's like, AI, it's supportive system for everywhere, for everything. And BI, it's more focusing on really decision making for management. So it's like what the wording say, business intelligence, right? How do I move forward? How do I grow my business? How do I develop my selling? How do I develop my people? So I see they're totally independent, these two areas, right? And um, I still stick with my um, understanding and with my um, experience decision-making on a business level will always be, always, always, maybe the next five, ten years, um, will be um, up to a human being. So artificial intelligence might, might help to, um, to prepare or to make some suggestions. And um, just to share some experience from, from my background, from my work, um, so when I do the evaluation for my clients, for example, right? And it's about a, the huge investments we are talking about. There are several millions, yeah, maybe 40 millions, whatever. And then um, we invest a lot of time and energy and money and like big team work. We evaluate first the requirement specification, then the evaluation. And then we are done with like this, do you know RFI process, RFP process, request for information, first step when you evaluate software. And the next step is a request for proposal. So it means when you're looking for a software on the market, you first send the message here, I'm looking for tool XYZ for business intelligence, like self services. And then um, companies can offer you something. And then you say, okay, you make a short list and say these three are coming and offering me something, right? And then you're investing a lot of time and energy. And then you evaluate it one and you say, oh, this one might be the right one for you. <laughs> and then a manager is coming and say, no, I don't, want to, I don't want to work with this company. I want to work with SAP. You know what I mean? So for me, like decision making, it's really a human being um, characteristic. So in, in business level. When I would say now in my business, when I say I want to grow, or I have business partner in America, so after this event, I fly to America for one week. And when I say a machine should decide for me how to grow my business, I think it's impossible. And this is what makes so exciting for me this development between artificial intelligence. It's for me a supportive system. It is not going to replace my mind. I hope not. Uh, <laughs> Silvio? Talk to uh, you next year. And then we'll <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 15 years later. Uh, Silvio, w what do you think? How strong can the AI's decision-making power become? Or let's say predictive power, because the decision may remain in the hands of the human. Well, uh, at the moment, I, I can say for sure, but I assume uh, big companies like Amazon already take great advantage of that. I think they can they can do do a little a little bit more than than uh, you know simple predictions. They can they can observe a lot of trends and and they can take a lot of uh, let's say educated actions using those. So yes, they they're probably using it at, as a tool. And, and there's a lot of people analyzing that and and making sure double checking, triple checking that everything is fine. But I'm sure it, it is used and it it is helping a lot uh, to understand some trends that may not be uh, directly visible to a person. So maybe using uh, an algorithm on a huge set of set of data 
can reveal some trends that that you cannot, you know. Uh, uh, what is it we are blind to that uh, the computers can see? Well, uh, maybe maybe our our brains are not, uh, you know, trained to handle uh, I don't know trillions and trillions of uh, data points, while uh, an algorithm can do it. You just need more horsepower. Okay, so uh, a quick question here, just to get a sense of the magnitude for a company like Amazon, what are we talking about here? Are, are we talking about like a small percentage of extra earnings? Is it like one percent? Is it like ten percent? Is it like eighty percent? I, I think we should we should ask them basically, but I, they're doing really well. I think. Okay, <laughs> Jeff. Yes. So uh, you look like you wanted to take the word. Uh, it's already gone. Okay, okay. So, um, <coughs> so one hypothesis that I've come across is that uh, changes that are very slow and changes that are very rapid are tricksy for the human nervous system to handle, but a computer can very well handle them. Does this match your practical experience in AI projects? Well, I, I think we, we, we are really good at some, some things, right? Uh, understanding and making sense of uh, of things with a, just a little bit of data points, so we we can learn how a car looks like, you know, very easily. You just see it a few a few times, and you know that's a car. You are, you, you have more data than than a computer usually has. You have the noise, you have the smell, you have the the colors, you have the the shape. Uh, so nowadays, to to train, let's say, a machine learning system to to detect and understand cars. It takes like a huge, huge amount of data, and I think that's uh, that's actually uh, the interesting part in the future is how how we're gonna, you know, build better uh, machine learning systems so they can understand the world more like faster, like like we do in in some cases. So you don't need like uh, I don't know petabytes of data about something to mm -hmm. train it to learn uh, to understand the, the, what a cat looks like. I would like to ask you a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit about Astro? Or was it Astro or Astra? Yes. Astro. Uh, so Astro was uh, our robot concept. Let's call it that way. We it was a brainchild of uh, a lot of geeks meeting up and thinking how, let's say, a robot that would be with you in the office every day look like, feel like, what it should do. So uh, what we came out with. Uh, what we came up with was uh, something like R2-D2, but with a virtual interface. So you could uh, talk to it like uh, like it's real, like a, like let's say a, a, with a, an avatar, uh, CGI avatar, 3D generated, but still uh, as realistic as possible. Uh, we wanted to have the the avatar to have audio and visual uh, cognitive. Uh, power, so it, it would not just understand uh, what you're saying, but also what you are experiencing at the moment, and uh, also recognizing who it's talking to, which is uh, quite relevant f uh, from my point of view, especially in terms of security. So let's say you, the AI has uh, access to some kind of database, and you want to retrieve some data. It, it should know it, it's you with 100% uh, certainty, if possible. So uh, we we try to to make Astro have the the latest and greatest in uh, both natural language processing, uh, computer vision, uh, interior navigation, uh, and also user experience. Even though I think it it might have gotten a little bit into the uncanny valley, which is uh, you know we have some kind of uh, force field. When, when something really, really new uh, comes to us, so we, we tend to reject it. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, th there's many robots right now on the market, and some look like really creepy. You know Sophia? <laughs> yeah, so... Who doesn't know Sophia? <laughs> yeah, there's... I, I'm not sure I've met her, but it's I, I saw a hundred robots at... Uh so we try to stay away from, from that level of creepiness by having uh, the avatar inside the screen, you know, like mm -hmm. w we're used to, to seeing 3D generated uh, content inside screen, so it, it's, it's a bit better. But So if I imagine this uh, Astro coming, rolling here across the stage, and then it looks at one of us or one of the members in the audience, how does it know what you feel? Uh, 
Well, it, it uses uh, AI so, or machine learning to, uh, let's say, take uh, live images of your face and try to determine if you're like uh, happy, sad, uh, distressed, uh, angry. Uh. Uh, at this point in time, is it better at doing this than a human being or does it still have a little bit of learning I, to do? I, I would say it's not better right now. I mean, some things are, are at human level in, uh, in computer vision and AI or even better than human level. But in, in this case, no, I think we're, we're better at reading more complex uh, facial expressions. And uh, also we, we have the an another variable, we have time. So you, you can observe a person, you know, getting upset, you know, and... Oh, Astro read. doesn't do this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> so, um, I would like to ask a predictive question. Oh, actually, that's the next question. Uh, first, I would like to ask you, could you give an example where business intelligence really helped, a concrete example, if possible, uh, where business intelligence really helped you solve a client's problem, a business situation, or possibly something in your own company? Well, this is an interesting question because this is what business intelligence does by definition. Right, so business intelligence provides you with data and then it's up to you what you do with it. It's not like it's saving lives, right? It gives you the data and then you see, in the, like, um, on business intelligence, what I don't do is, no, I'm not the guy who is doing the reporting or something like this, yeah, because for this there are tools and they're providing it. What I do is more about the background, right? So what are the systems that are connected? How to um, systemize, synchronize the, um, interfaces are between the systems. I'm the technical guy, right? So, and then I have the help the business. And then when you see, for example, like all the big um, um, meetings where the CEO or CFO are staying in front of the 400, 4,000 people and telling oh, how great our year was, right? This is based on the projects. It's not like on a point like somebody was about to die and it came and s saved the life. So it's, it's not that kind of business intelligence. Uh, I see. So it's mostly a kind of decision foundation for exactly, moving forward. Exactly, exactly. And then yes. you have like, I have got one client, it was so funny, I knew exactly, um, so they had like data, daily da data run, and they've got a reporting about the sales. They were so determined to grow the sales, so he wanted to know every single morning at 6 a.m. the sales data from the previous day, and um, I knew exactly when I have a phone call, five minutes past six, something went wrong. So this might be, be defining to, you know, to a question, did it ever save a life? So well, not this way. Not I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Life, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it always depends on how do you um, treat your data, how important it is to you, and what do you do out of it. And in this case, it was not really very important, right? Oh, I can give you one situation. Oh, now I've got Brilliant. it. Yeah, now I've got it. It was, this was a very funny one. Um, so um, it was about to introduce a new product on the market. And for this market, it was for an insurance company in Switzerland. And um, for this introduction of this product, um, all the general managers and agencies uh, represent, have been um, invited from all the Switzerland. So it was like a very, very big meeting. And they wanted, of course, to see the date and everything. So, and on this day, I had Friday, I had um, the day off, but we talked about before about trust and at value. So the client of mine, she was um, responsible to run the meeting and she calls me two hours before the meeting and she says, Christina, all the data are gone. So there's nothing there. So there will be now six, 60 people on the highest level from the entire country are coming now to my meeting and I have right nothing, absolutely nothing to show, right? So I said, okay, so what do we say? Sorry, I'm not in the office, I can't. Please help me. I said, okay, so, so what? So I'm to, to, to my office, I have remote access. And um, so I saw the issues on the system. Um, and it was an external company, another one who was responsible for the data load. This was another funny thing. They just charged, the day before, they charged me, because I was responsible for the project budget, for the data load processes, and on the next day, everything was red. So there were no data in the system, but we just paid the day before. I was like, oh, what the, what's going on here? So what I did, did I do? I just um, solved all the issues and provide all the data, and like it was like four minutes before the meeting started, the data were there. So you know, like, like 
but it's not, not something specific to business intelligence itself. It's just how project goes, right? So you're working on something, and out of, um, of the blue, everything is gone, and you have to solve it. Uh. And th but this was pretty funny, uh, because she was like totally happy. She was like, well, you saved my life. I said, this is your job, but it's okay. Well, short margins always create a, a big dramatic impact. Uh, so I, I would like to ask you something else, and, and this is development over time. When you started out uh, doing a business, using business intelligence, what was it like at that time selling uh, business intelligence, getting customers, getting clients, now that you already have a network of clients? Well, so your question is, what is the difference between getting clients onboarded 20 years ago and now, or in this process? Yes. Yeah. Um, I have been asked again and again, what does it make to succeed in IT business? And my answer is pretty simple. There are people. And I will always stick with this one. Artificial intelligence, business intelligence, machine learning, you name it. For me, the success is always people. It's people business. And IT business is even more people business than the most people are thinking. Because you are handling, you're managing very different type of people. When you're talking to a developer, you have to talk a different language. And I'm not talking about Serbian or German or English. You are just have to talk a different language. When you're talking to C4, you have to talk a different language again, right? So when you want to succeed, it's always people business. In terms of the technology, what I've seen, of course, when I've started, so you did, every, like, I did everything by hand, black, black screens, right, and white um, characters. This is what we've seen, and this is how we developed the systems. And today it's more about the tools, and I guess, so what is more, today more important, that you have more analytical skills, right? So you have to see the whole picture, and then to take the right tool, right? A couple years ago, it was about like when you said, oh, I can work with this tool. Everybody was totally happy and say, oh, yeah, please come, 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 come. Yeah. But it's not about the tools anymore because there are so many. You can just pick one. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make a, a, another example, but you wouldn't like it. It's like with men and women. If there are so many. You can just take one. What does make you special? They are the skills. Do you connect to the person? Do you not connect to the person? Yeah, it's, uh, uh, you mentioned this thing about speaking different languages with a developer and the CIO or CFO. Um, now, I know you have a talent for learning languages, but how did you learn these languages? Try and error. It was, I, I have to say, it was a big pain in my bag in the beginnings. Um, a, an advantage I've got is I have been developing myself, so I know how it goes, how it works. Um, but I definitely have to say it was a learning curve. Right, because first in the beginning I was feeling like I'm talking ag against the wall, right? But then, like um, I started to read the feedbacks on the faces, on the memes, wherever it is, and just by experience, you just listen to it and you learn it, right? And um, I made um, very good experience with uh, getting feedbacks. W what I always do when I work with somebody, I first ask for the expectations. Yeah, I always ask, what is your expectation when you work together? What do you want to get? 20% more revenue? Do you want to get more clients? Do you want to get better tools? What do you want to, want to do, right? And in the end, I do the review, and then I ask, did you get it? Yeah, and in the beginning, there were some nice experiences when we were maybe not that successful. And then, but for me, it was the biggest learning curve is when you fail. You can say what you want. And it doesn't matter, it's in, in business when you are employed or when you run your own business, you have to fail to learn. Yeah. And when I would have said, I always could understand developers and CFOs, it's not true. So I had really to learn, really sometimes very badly, when a developer just um, crashed that door and just said, I don't talk to her anymore, and whatever it was, right? And now when I see the projects, I, on the other side, when a CIO interrupts me and say, Christina, how did you do it? I say, how did I do what? How did you succeed? I say, yeah, we are just about to show you because it was a presentation of um, re review of the project. I said, no, 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 I'm not talking about the, the numbers. How did you do it that my team not only worked together, but to that success, right? So uh, I'm going to ask you about this because this is, after a project is finished, everybody knows that you're supposed to take into account the feedback and usually people just skip that. So how large a percentage of your time energy do you devote to this taking the feedback into account and... Um... Well, for me, it's um, 
the same importance like to do the project itself. Um, most of the people underestimate it, right? For me, it's like when I do a project, it's like I do it for you like I would do it for me. Yeah. And then um, it's sometimes clients don't come back and it's okay. So you can't keep everybody for, for, for your entire life. So who cares? You have like a partner for life phase. You have a business partner for life phase. You have a client for life phase. You don't have them for the old time. I have some clients I kept for, for, forever. And there are some that are coming and, and, and leaving. And then for me, it's very important to understand why did the one client stay? So I keep going the same way, I'm doing the same things. And then when another client may be left, and I, I'm sad, I say, hey, we did such a great job, so why did you leave? Yeah, or why did you um, ask me again for, 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 for another um, collaboration? And then I learn now for it. And um, I, I, just, I just really sent the service, and I asked my clients, please, uh, what was, how, what, what oh, very important thing, I ask, what is about my um, social, uh, my, my soft skills? What is about communication? And sometimes people, so some of you who um, experience me, I'm very um, emotional and I'm straight to the point, right? And some people just can't manage it. So I had to learn how to um, communicate my message without being me sometimes, but not giving up on me, but just to to talk it in your language, so your way, across. exactly. Because otherwise, when I am somewhere, and you should experience me, I'm like, poof, you know, like, tong, tong, but, but in a positive way. When I come, people say, oh, wonderful, we have been working for so long and nothing happened, but now you came, and in three months, we have such a great result. How did you do it? I say, I just do it. You know, and they'll be, mm. Okay, I, I'm going to move to Silvio now in a moment, but I just want to underscore this, the first, uh, first part of the answer as important as the project itself. Impressive. Definitely. Silvio, can you tell me, tell us uh, the, sa uh, the same question? When you started out 20 years ago, and now, <laughs> <laughs> okay, when you started out, and now, how, what's the situation like when it's about getting customers, clients? Well, uh, I've I've been I started out as uh, let's say doing consultancy and uh, doing projects just a couple of years ago, and I I think at the beginning it it was a bit difficult for me to explain to people how uh, computer vision or AI can help them, and in what ways, but I I think it's getting easier and easier now, and I can thank I don't know the internet and. Everything. So, uh, what's the difference? Uh, oh, is, is it just external that the internet has changed people's understanding? I think so. I think so. I think people are getting more educated into uh, artificial intelligence, and they get more curious about it, and and they want to to l learn more about it. At least, uh, uh, it, it feels like that to me that that people are more keen to to get into it and and use it in their businesses and uh, make things smarter for, I don't know, for a factory, for example, to, to uh, automize something instead of having a person uh, doing it. And uh, it, uh, they understand that it, it can be done faster this way and with less error. And uh, even though it's an investment, uh, it's something that, that is going to pan out in the, in the long term. So, yeah, at the beginning, it, it was really difficult to, to explain to people, hey, you, you, you could use this, and especially if they, they found it maybe costly or uh, they could not imagine exactly if it, w if it will work, that maybe they would feel it's, like, uh, not possible. Mm -hmm. So you, you say, I can do this for you, and it, maybe in their head it's, it was not, uh, like, something... They so, they so you sell it by what it can actually do, how it gets you from A to B, how it creates results. Exactly, so uh, the, the big question is, can it help your business? If, if it can help your business, I, I, I can tell you uh, with a high degree of honesty, how much can you gain from it? And if, if you believe that that's, uh, that's important for you as, as a customer or and as a business owner, then, then you, you will probably decide to invest in it and take a leap of faith, let's call it uh, like that. Because it's something it's, it, that is unknown to you. It may be you know, like, a, like a black box that you imagine you put mm -hmm. in, in your system somewhere and uh, it does some amazing thing. So yeah, the getting people to understand that and to have this kind of trust that you can deliver the, the product 
uh, is, is, I think, the, the greatest task. Uh, could you give us an example? You work with facial recognition and surveillance in some cases. So what could be a very concrete example of the customer benefit? So le let's imagine you, you have a, a big office building, right? And uh, you want to, to use uh, cameras and sensors to, to monitor that everything is, is all right in there. So uh, it, it can be beneficial in, in many ways. Once it, it, it can help with security a lot. And you maybe you just need one security guard to just be there and watch everything. But the AI will also watch everything. So uh, you know our, our attention is, is not perfect, right? If you put like uh, 100 screens in front of someone, it'll be really difficult for that person to follow each of them. So AI does this easily. Uh, secondly, if you have some sensors uh, in that building, which you also monitor via AI, you can see if something wrong happens, like a fire or, or, or a big problem that you can, you can alleviate immediately. So there's, there's many use cases. This, this could be a simple I, I, one. I think I came across a quote by Tom Peters uh, yesterday. Uh, a bureaucrat is just an expensive microchip. Uh, is this where we are heading? I, I think uh, there is a, a trend, and there's actually a, a startup uh, right now in Bucharest. They, they're the first unicorn in Romania. So they're doing robotic process automation. I, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the term. It's really a really hot topic right now for uh, a lot of companies uh, because they're trying to, uh, one, speed up some of the processes they have, uh, the bureaucratic processes they have in their, mm -hmm. in their companies. Uh, but more than speed up, they can actually uh, vastly decrease the chance of error in that process. So let's say you're processing some documents and you're not paying sufficient attention and you're processing 100 documents uh, per day. Maybe you, you, you make mistakes in maybe two or three of them, but over time, you know, those add up and in the end you might have a lot of losses, especially if you have a, you're like a, a big data processor. So uh, we are talking here about reviewing applications or reading medical journals. I, I, mean, I mean, again, this is stuff. Uh, no, th this, is, this is, I think, purely for, for business. So you, you have like a big company who will, will have a lot of invoices, will have a lot of contracts, and you, you can use AI to you know, uh, review them for you and transform them into, I don't know, uh, digital... Uh, documents that are, are easy for you to search in and, and find out stuff from them and uh, uh, you don't even need someone to you know to go to the, the scan room anymore. You can just have an automatic scanner and it'll, it'll do that for you and you can you can imagine robots or, or RPA as, uh, as something that uh, makes makes some of the processes that are done right now by, by people uh, that are, are doing this kind of bureaucratic, uh, uh, I don't know how to say, tasks, uh, the RPA can, can totally replace that because they're not really uh, something complex. They're, they replace menial tasks, that's, that's it. So uh, menial, w what I'm after here is, uh, does it also replace the cognitive side of it? Uh, like, can we fire the interns at a law firm? I don't think you need to fire the interns at a, a law firm. But let me rephrase the question: Can the robot do their jobs, or uh, a significant part of their jobs? The robots could do a part of their job that might take a lot of their time, and th they could use that time to learn more law. <laughs> okay. Um. <coughs> So let's assume someone uh, in the audience, perhaps, would be very interested in uh, entering the field of AI or BI. What would you recommend as a good first step? Where could they learn about uh, the respective field? What sort of business should they try to work in? What sort of uh, projects should they pursue? How, how do you get into the real know-how? Well, right now I think it's it's pretty easy to to get into it. Uh, when I started, like Google.com. Yes, yeah, it starts with <laughs> Google now. 
And uh, I think that maybe uh, when, when I started, uh, there was like, uh, the gateway was, was a little bit uh, harder than right now. Uh, because you, you would have to write many things as on your own. I mean, the first algorithms I did in AI were written by me from, from scratch. So there's a lot of investment you have to do to, to see some results as a, a software developer back then. Uh, right now, you can, you can use a lot of platforms that are already you know, available for free on GitHub by Google or uh, Facebook. There's, there's some uh, deep learning platforms like TensorFlow or Cafe, which make it uh, like that simple. You just need to know a little bit of Python and invest some time into uh, some courses. Just follow some, some, uh, some blueprints and it's, it's that easy right now. And the next step, do you get employed or do you start your own company? If you work for a company, uh, you, you get a lot of insight of how things can be done. If the company is really good, then you get a lot of really, really uh, valuable uh, lessons. And uh, why? Why should I start learning about AI? What is the most fun in AI? I think you can begin learning AI as a hobby if you're not a, a developer right now. But if you're a developer, you should learn AI because if you don't, you're gonna be obsolete soon. So that's, uh, that's my take on it. <laughs> I love it, so learn AI or be obsolete. <laughs> I do believe you're right, but. <laughs> okay, uh, Christina. Uh, so let's assume so there is basically the same line of questioning. If someone is interested in working with business intelligence, how do they start to learn? And where do they go? And how, do, how should one approach? Well, for business intelligence, it's a very bright spectrum on tools on the market. I would say it, first of all, depends on the job they want to do. Because you can be the developer, you can be the business um, analyst, you can be the requirements uh, engineer. It always depends on, on your view on the tools and on the um, topic itself, right? Um, when you're more into um, coding, there are many conferences. So I'm a big fan of conferences for different ways. I'm um, very out, um, out um, how do you say it, when you learn by yourself. I learn very fast by myself. Autodidact. Thank you, this one. Um, and, um, but still, um, I love to interact with people. And they are like for particular topics, like when you take SAP, there's SAP Tehet. So you go like for four days, they're always in different cities. Like four, four days um, in Barcelona, for example, or Berlin, or Madrid, you name it, and they go every year to another city. And you have, like, in four days, all the topics, like, the, which are actual for, the, for this particular software, the same for Microsoft, for other tools, they all do this, because for them it's a marketing event, of course. Um, these events are very expensive. Like, you pay for this three, four days, just the participation without expenses, two and a half, three thousand euros, right? So it's a very costly thing because you earn a lot of money with it, of course, right? So, and like uh, the same here, you have so many tools and they will like them. I guess development will get obsolete in business intelligence as well. Yeah, because you have all the uh, wizards and tools, is everything there. You just need to know how to integrate them, how to work with them, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what would you say should be or can be the driving force? What makes business intelligence fun? Oh, well, for me, it's a big fun because I work with every department in a company. So this is, for me, the most exciting thing about business intelligence. You will never, ever, and this is a promise. We're not write me an email, then later on, I, I, I will invite you for a drink uh, to make up for it. You will never have the same project twice. It's simply impossible because you have su such high complexity on data. You have every company is different structured. You have always different requirements. You have different um, subsystems which delivering data. You're working with every department in the company because every department is uh, providing data and want to see the results. And for me, it's like every single day is different. For the people who stick to the routine, it might be too much. I can't have the routine, for me it's absolutely perfect. I just love it. And you have all the time, I have a challenge. Because it's not, not like I did it yesterday so I know how it will work tomorrow because tomorrow I have different data, I have different client, I have different requirements and I have really literally to, st to start every single time from, from scratch from the beginning. I have my knowledge of course, I can base on it and I'm really um, grateful for it and my clients as well. 
but it's always like a surprise. So I'm always excited what is going in on the next project. Sounds extremely interesting. It is, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I'd like to ask Silvio, um, when we spoke previously, we, you mentioned the term moonshot. And a moonshot project is, of course, something that may or may not succeed. Actually, the chances of failure are pretty high. But it's still worth doing. Astro would be such a project. Have you got any others that you would like to share? Well, we, we did have two moonshots, or actually, yeah, two and a half, I would say. Uh, another big moonshot project was uh, something we did uh, a couple of years ago. It was called, it's actually the, the project that gave a little bit of the name of our company. Uh, it, the project was called Helios. Uh, it, it was a headgear for people with low vision. So basically we were trying to enhance the level of uh, vision and understanding for, for uh, people with visual impairment. They would uh, wear this headgear, which used some uh, 3D cameras and some uh, nice AI algorithms to, to do this. So they, they would capture the information in front of them and they would translate it into something uh, that they could understand, tailored for them. It could also read for them, uh, which is uh, quite, quite a feat. Uh, and it could offer them, let's say, contextual information that they never had before. Because the, we, we're, we're, we take some things for granted, like understanding what, what the, your facial expression, for example. But for someone who has never really seen well, they, they don't know how to do this. It's, uh, it's something totally new. So, so how was this um, contextual information presented? Uh, audibly. Audibly, OK. So we, we actually used some um, special type of uh, headphones. They're called bone conduction uh, speakers. So they would, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they attach to, to your uh, cranial uh, bone structure. And you can, you can hear the hear like you would hear with a headphone, but without losing your, uh, your hearing ability. So it was, it was just extra information they, they, could, they could gain. Brilliant. Thank you. So, uh, but this one was a moonshot that never came into production. Uh, yes, it, it, it was. Unfortunately, it was a, a moonshot. I mean, what we wish we could do and, and the reality is uh, many, many times it, uh, they, they don't match. So uh, technologically, hardware is not there yet. Uh, as you may know, there's, there's a startup called Magic Leap who is struggling to, to bring something really cool to the market for the past three years, and they had like one and a half billion or something investment. And so uh, let me just check that I understand this. Magic Leap, it's like playing Pokemon, but with your glasses instead of the mobile phone. Yes, so the, I, th I think that they're, what they're trying to, to build and uh, their promise is to have something like HoloLens, but, you know, a hundred times better. So, so it's uh, the, the stuff that you're creating in the augmented reality is really there. Yeah, I, th I think they, they want to make it as realistic as possible and, and to, you know, make AR what it's been promising to do for, I don't know, the past 15 years. Okay. Um, so, do you have any sources of information you go to regularly to keep you up to date in the field? Or any sources of information that you'd like to share with the audience? Like, for example, when I was a programmer, I used to check out TechCrunch every day. <laughs> uh, yeah, TechCrunch, for sure. You, you can learn some nice news there. Uh, I think if, if anyone is, is someone developer here in the room, so we have a few developers. Uh, I think they all use Stack Overflow. If they, no, you don't use Stack Overflow. Okay. So you know everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. No. Um, you can, uh, see, yeah, so, so that guy codes. <laughs> uh, you can, uh, of course, use a lot of the MOOCs that are available right now. I'm a big fan of, uh, of the courses that are available online. So you can, uh, 
you can get some really quick training into something. You don't need to go to Stanford to access a Stanford course anymore, which is uh, actually amazing. Uh, there's also, in my case, there's research papers, which may be harder to read if you're not in the domain. There's a lot of jargon inside, and you need to know a lot of things that were written before to understand what's written now. Uh, but those are also really, really good uh, place to to get information. And I think there's uh, there's a lot of Facebook groups right now uh, where where you can, you know, join people who are in s a specific community for development or AI or computer vision. And I think you, you just need to, to search for it. There's, there's m or there's GitHub if you want to search for anything. I mean, uh, for coding. Uh, there's many people who actually uh, contribute to, to the world on GitHub. And you, you can, can see what they do and, and learn from, from their work and make your work better. OK, Christina, the same question. Uh, yeah, so for BI, so I don't code anymore. So I can't um, help on this one where to get like the, all the hands on. At the moment, what I do is the um, same like you in the groups, but I'm more on LinkedIn. So for me, it's like more really like strategical decisions that I have to support my clients with. And on LinkedIn, I get all my groups. It's I don't know how many I have, like really too, too many maybe. And they are like, um, the good thing about groups is you have several different people and with different skills and different priorities. And then you can sort out for you which topic is interesting for you. And then you can follow up on this one. So this is how I do it. Brilliant. Uh, I would like to move um, perhaps to some questions to the audience, uh, but could I have a time check, please? Uh, could I have a time check, please? It's time, okay. So not even, a, uh, we'll take one question from the audience. Okay, brilliant. Well, I think I think uh, there's something re really cool happening right now that you have this choice. Wh when I started, the only choice to do AI was to, to go into uh, academia or research. Uh, now you can actually go to a really cool company like Google or Facebook or whatnot, go as an intern, say I want to do AI and, and be really passionate about it. And I think you can you can learn uh, as much or even even more uh, in a, inside a company right now. So yeah, now, now there's there's the choice for that, and I, I think it's uh, it's amazing. And third, if if neither of these options are available to you, you you have the choice to invest, of course, invest your time uh, or your free time into into learning, and you do have to uh, learn some of the bases before uh, tackling you know some some big problem. But I don't think it it will take that long to to understand it. I think if you, if you you really like the topic, then you will devour that information and, uh, and you won't even notice the time passing. Welcome. Okay, so um, I, I would like to thank the two of you, of course. Uh, I learned plenty of interesting stuff, but I got to ask the questions. <laughs> I do hope the audience had some uh, good takeaways also. So thank you, Silvio. Thank you, Christina. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for staying so long. Uh, I hope it was useful for you. I hope you learned so much. 
I hope it wasn't boring. Uh, tonight at nine o'clock there will be networking with other participants, with our colleagues from Silicon Drink About and Moon Sushi Bar at nine o'clock. Znači vidimo se u Sushi Baru u Makedonskoj 31, događaj počinje od osam, tako da samo pređete preko puta i možete nastaviti i druženje. Mnogo vam hvala na poseti i vidimo se sutra. Program počinje u deset do devet. Hvala vam.